Good morning. You know, it is great to be here and to be uh, involved with the church. And, and I, I even want to say to know that Kelly and I are a part of a church that believes in missions. You know, there's a lot of churches out there. I don't know if you know this statistic, but uh, most churches out there, 70% of their income uh, or, or their tithes and offerings are spent on internal matters. And, and I really think that we ought to flip that upside down on its head. We, we should be spending 70% of all that comes into the church for reaching people for Christ. It, it, you know, we need to take care of our own. We need, to, we need to do things. But if we do things God's way, then we know how to take care of ourselves. And it's the rest of the world that does it. And, uh, you know, Ryan says that he gets more sleep on a mission trip than he does anyplace else, but I'm still going to be praying for him because I have been with youth on a mission trip. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and to go someplace uh, like they're going and, and to be able to see um, all of the, the, the struggles that people in this world do, this is going to be a great learning experience uh, for these folks. And, and uh, it, it makes me think of... of one of my favorite verses of the Bible is, is Genesis 12, uh, 2, where, where basically we're told, Mike's paraphrase, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. And, and I always tell folks, well, you go on a mission trip, you're getting ready to go, and man, you, you think, you kind of get full of yourself, and you're like, you know what, when we go on this mission trip, we are going to be such a blessing to these people. But when you get there, what you find out is that you're the one that really gets to experience the blessing because you see how much God has blessed you and, and you get to experience God using you in other people's lives. And it is a wonderful blessing. And he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people. So um, I, I want to I speak on, on a couple of very familiar verses today. But before I do, I, I need to ask a question. And I'm going to be really honest with you, I'm going to lead you astray slightly, because I want to make sure that everybody's being honest with me, okay? So I don't want anybody to be embarrassed, like our, our young folks that were up here singing. If I was up here, I'd probably been embarrassed too, okay? But uh, I want to know, I want to ask you a question about some stories in the Bible, and if you have never heard of any of these, uh, these stories in the Bible, I'd like you to raise your hand. I don't want you to be embarrassed, I just, I, I want to know um, want to know what you know, per se, okay? Uh, for instance, who has heard of Abraham in the Bible? Who, who, okay, who has not heard of Abraham in the Bible? Okay, so everybody here has heard of Abraham in the Bible. If you, if you again, are too embarrassed to, to raise your hand, just look at Genesis uh, chapters 12 through 25, and uh, throughout the rest of Scripture for that matter, but that's the focus on, on, on Abraham. Um, what about, has anybody heard of uh, the phoenix rising out of the ashes? Okay, has anybody heard of that in the Bible? Or who hasn't? Quite a few people, and that's a trick question because it's not in the Bible, okay? <laughs> it, it's, it's, in, it's in the Apocrypha, but it's not in this Bible, okay? So again, a trick question. I want to see if, if we're being uh, honest here. Uh, who has not heard of a talking donkey in the Bible? So everybody's heard of a talking donkey. We've got one that has not heard of the talking donkey. We've got another one, okay? Shrek was not the first. Uh, the, the story of Shrek does not have the first talking donkey, and this one's much more appropriate than the movie Shrek, okay? Uh, in Numbers 21 or 22, I believe, if you want to look that one up, there is a talking donkey in Scripture. Um, who, um, let me think of another one here that might be a little bit more obscure, who hasn't heard of a man sacrificing his daughter up to the Lord? Okay? People have not heard of that. Okay? Quite a few people. It's in, in Judges. I believe the last couple of chapters of Judges. Um, a man offers his daughter up to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Well, as a sacrifice. So... Um, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but, but it's, it's kind of proving my point. I'm asking this question within the church, and I want to ask you a question just for you to think about for a moment. How many people outside of the walls of this church do you think have any idea about any of these stories? It could be, uh, they might know about Jesus dying on the cross, but do they, do they know about the real Jesus that's out there? That the real Jesus that's here, right? Do they know about 
John the Baptist? Do they know about Abraham? Do they know about Isaac and Jacob and, and uh, Joseph and, and uh, uh, Egypt? Do they know the Ten Commandments? I, I talked to a gentleman the other day that I had working with me that I've been witnessing to for a while. He never saw the movie with Charles Heston in it, so he had no idea about the Ten Commandments. Isn't that amazing? Let's turn to a very familiar passage, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. I thought this would be appropriate since we are commissioning some missionaries today to to go on a short-term mission trip. But the truth of the matter is we have all been commissioned to be on missions. Every one of us that profess Christ as Lord. I want to read this, and, and then we'll go through uh, it, it bit by bit. I just want to make a few key points. Again, I know this is a very familiar passage, probably to all of us, if not all of us, most of us. Very, very famous words from our Lord and Savior. Uh, before I read these, let me pray for us. Father in heaven, Lord, we do pray for Ryan and this uh, wonderful group of people that wish and desire to go share your word, to go share your truth with the Navajos. Lord, we pray that you give them safe passage, that you would give them favor with this people, that you would help them to remember the simplicity of your message, and that each and every one of us here today would take that simplicity, that we would not overcomplicate it, but we would share your love amongst this world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I, w- I want to let you know, first of all, I am not a Greek scholar. I am not a Greek scholar. And I know that most of you probably aren't either. Paul, perhaps, okay? But I am not a Greek scholar, but I have software, okay? It makes it easier. And I've noticed some things about this very familiar passage with my software. One is, when we go through and we look at Scripture, we, we always, at least those of us that preach the Word of God, we always talk about imperatives, Imperatives are, are verbs that tell us it's, it's like a command. It's not a, a, a suggestion. It's a command of something that we're supposed to do. And if I read this passage in the English and I don't understand Greek, which I share with you, I, I'm in the same boat as, as most of you, uh, we read this, we read several different imperatives. But really, there's only two in this passage and one that I want to focus on. And the imperative that's found in this passage is the making of disciples. Go, therefore, is not an imperative. Baptizing is not an imperative. Teaching isn't even an imperative. Making the disciples is the imperative of this. The go and the baptizing and the telling is how we make disciples. But the making of disciples is not an option. The Lord is telling us that we must make disciples. We must make disciples of all nations. And, and it's, it's interesting with this, if you recall, go back in Scripture, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, when Jesus sends out the disciples, he tells them to go, but he also puts limitations on their going in that particular period of time. And, and at that time, he tells them, hey, Go and tell the nation of Israel. And it's not that he, they can't tell the Gentiles, but there seems to be certain limitations on telling the Gentiles anything. But here, they're told to go and tell the nations. So something has changed. Something has changed. And, and so we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. Okay? So the imperative is making disciples. So how do we, we do that? That's, that's the easy part of all this, right? But I I have come to understand through studying these three verses and just life experience recently, we overcomplicate this. 
This is extremely easy if we just do it God's way, which isn't that how it almost always is? If we handle our finances God's way, don't they just take care of themselves, John? Right? The financial guy? If we, if we handle our marriage God's way, isn't it pretty simple to have a good marriage? Right? Making disciples is the same way. It's very simple, and the ingredients are right here. So let's make some disciples. First of all, what has changed here is the very first verse that Jesus tells us. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When Jesus, prior to his resurrection, he had given up some of his, his divine ability, some of, of the things that, that uh, the power and the majesty that he had so that he could come and, and be here in the form of a man. For instance, the most obvious one is uh, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, they are everywhere right now, right? They're omnipresent, we say. Jesus, when he came and walked amongst us, he wasn't everywhere at the same time. Pretty simple, right? Okay. Now Jesus has risen from the dead, and he says, all authority, not only on earth, but in heaven, in heaven and on earth, everything, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. I am authoritatively sending you to make disciples. Okay? Now, I find this really interesting. We all grow, grow up, and we are all told in the church, hey, let's, we're, we're going to do this big special in the church, and we want everybody to invite their family and friends to come to church with us. I got thinking about this. Nowhere in Scripture are we ever told to invite somebody to come to church with us. Nowhere. You ever thought about that? Peter gets a message from the Lord and he goes to Cornelius. Paul gets up in the morning and he decides to go down to a creek where it's known for people to pray and he witnesses to a lady by the name of Lydia. Um, in, in Acts and Paul and his missionary journeys, they would get up and they would go to the synagogue to tell people about Jesus. Everywhere that we see in Scripture, it's all about the going of Christ. The going of Christ through his disciples. We never invite anybody. I think it's, it's, it's interesting to me. You guys know our story about us uh, working with the church in, in Fruta. And, and I'm going to tell you, we have worked our tails off. We have had... Uh, free soccer clinics, we've had block parties, we've done missional work over there and, and, and stuff, and some of it is part of the going. But in thinking about that, we have invented events to try to draw people to us, to help them to like us. And yet if we look at this, I see it more the fact that Jesus just says, hey Mike, why don't you go where, where people are already at? and be with them in what they're already doing. Let them know that you love them regardless. I mean, isn't that simple? The problem is that the reason why that's difficult is because we want people to come where we're comfortable. We don't want to go where they're comfortable. We're going to go sleep on floors. We're going to go, we're going to go stay where there's no running water, where the houses in most of our neighborhoods would be condemned. Are you going to be comfortable going there? bunch of teenagers might be. This is cool, right? We just need some paintball guns and have paintball wars. But no, this is where people live. This is where people live. You know, I think it's interesting. Kelly will not go with me to Nepal. She will not go with me to Nepal. But she'll go with me to Haiti, and I keep trying to tell her Haiti is more dangerous than Nepal, okay? She, she doesn't, I think part of it's the food thing. Because she doesn't, you know, Napoleon food is a little different. <laughs> and, and in Haiti, she can get American food. But she will not go with me to Nepal. But now that she's been to Haiti and she's experienced the poverty of those people, she just loves the, the Haitian people. She just loves them. These guys are going to go down and, 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 and be with these people in our own country that are have, living in such poverty. And when they go down there, if they have the love of Christ that they profess, they're going to fall in love with these people right there where they're at. 
We have to, to go to the people where, places where people are hurting. We have to let them know we care. We think of them as being family, even in the uncomfortable places of the world. It really is that simple. We have to go. We have to go. Next, we, we have to baptize them. And this one here, there's so many different theologies on baptism. But there's something I noticed in this text that, that just strikes me as being, um, in one aspect, it's, it's amazing. In other aspects, it's, it's a little strange. But we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice the, the word name. Do you see that that's singular? Now, a guy like myself that's always trying to prove the Trinity, I understand it from that perspective. But I think it's even deeper than that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're to baptize into that name. Into that name. What's that mean? To be baptized in the name of the Father. To be baptized in the name of Jesus. It's not names, it's the name. Of course, we know that this means that there's one God, right? He has three names or three persons, but it's one God but I'm baptized into the Father. Or maybe even more appropriately, he's somewhat baptized into me. How do we have the power to go? First of all, we got the authority of Jesus, right? He's the one that's sending us. But we also have the power by which we are going, being baptized into the family of God. We're baptized into, into the Father, into the Son, into the Holy Spirit. You know, you go out, I don't, I don't care if you're talking to the bum at Walmart that takes his leg off to make everybody feel bad about his circumstance, or if you're talking to a high executive on Wall Street, it doesn't make any difference anywhere in between. Everybody wants to belong to the family. Everybody wants to belong to the family. And I believe this into the Father, into the Son, into the Holy Spirit. We're baptizing them, of course, like like, uh, John did, into repentance. It's it's a symbol, as we we profess in our faith, that that this is showing a change of heart, a change of direction, when we are refocusing our life on something bigger than ourselves. It's no longer about Mike. It's about the King that I serve, the Lord Jesus, right? Right? But isn't it even more powerful if we baptize people into the family of God that now they belong to to this royal kingship? Isn't that beautiful? Have you ever thought about it that way? So when we go, what are we doing? We're going, again, with that authority of Jesus, but at the same time, we're going and we are inviting the people into the royal family. And, And I don't know why it took me so long to notice this, because Kelly will tell you when we were in Haiti, we flew into Dominican Republic, and, and we uh, took, I don't know, like 15 bags with us. And, and we were, but we weren't, smuggling medical supplies into Haiti. And the reason why I say that we, we were not is because of the fact that it wasn't illegal, anything that we were doing. But we were, because if you go through customs in Haiti and they find those kind of things, they usually keep them for themselves and then turn around and sell them back out to their public and make money. It's a corrupt government. In fact, that's one thing. If you leave our country and you go on missions elsewhere, as corrupt as our government is, you'll learn to appreciate them, okay? I never thought I'd say that either. There's sometimes I'm happy about paying taxes, okay? (laughs) But we we smuggled them in, and and we took a bus from uh, the DR to Capation, Haiti, and uh, uh, part of the reason why we did that is because we're trying to avoid customs. Well, guess what? We got stopped by customs. And as we got stopped by customs, um, some of the folks that were with us, they were uh, 
frantically concerned because they're going through people's bags, seeing what's all in there. And as we got stopped, I said, folks, we don't need to worry about this. They said, why not? I said, I talked to my dad this morning. He said, it's going to be okay. And they said, you did what? I said, yeah, my dad's the king. And he said that it's okay, that we've got, we got granted permission to bring this stuff in, and he's watching over things. And they got off the bus, and they're going through everybody's belongings, and there's like 15 bags they didn't go through. And guess which 15 bags that that was? They didn't touch a single one of our bags. Yeah. When we're baptized into the royal family, we have special privileges that other families just don't have. And who doesn't want that, right? Who doesn't want that? So they're baptized into the family, and, and again, I don't want us to think that bapti- baptism, the word is immersion, okay? Again, in the Greek, it's immersion. And, and I wholeheartedly believe that. I believe that people should be baptized, immersed in water. But I think that if we look here at what Jesus is saying, we've got a twofold picture. We've got to baptize them into the family, and we illustrate that by immersion. Does that make sense? Okay. Teaching them. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This one here, I believe that there are a lot of groups out there that take this too far. Have you ever heard somebody say, I haven't sinned since I... Surrendered my life to Christ. I always think to myself, you just did. Right? Okay. We all know, at least I hope you know, that even after Jesus, there is no perfection this side of heaven. Okay. Does he want us to strive for perfection? Absolutely. But I want us us to look at something really quick. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Going to be to the right just a little bit. Luke chapter 11. Okay. We know this passage as being the Lord's Prayer, but I want to, I want to point out a couple of things. This is Jesus. There, there's his disciples come to him one day and they say, Hey, Rabbi, would you teach us to pray? He said, Sure, I'll teach you to pray. Okay. So this is one of those things that Jesus has taught us, right? and that we're supposed to teach ourselves. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. Now, to me, if Jesus is teaching me to pray, he's not saying, Mike, the first time you pray, you pray this. And then after that, you don't need to worry about that. It, it kind of, I think he's saying, hey, Mike, every time that you pray, you need to be cognitive to the fact that you are still a sinner and you need to ask for forgiveness of those sins. Okay? To further illustrate this, if we drop down here a little ways, he's talking about asking for things, and, and I'll pick up in verse 9 here. And I tell you, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will not find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You who are evil. It kind of hurts, doesn't it, to know that we are still considered evil by our Lord. But I want us to, the, 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 the point I'm making here, we are to teach them to observe All that Jesus has commanded us, right? To obey all that he has commanded us. We need to be very careful not to be legalistic and say to somebody that you're damned, that you're going to hell because I stubbed my toe and I said a bad word. Right? That is not what Jesus is telling us here. That is not what Jesus is telling us here. 
We, we, he's not looking for perfection, okay? I think the biggest key here is that we have to know who Jesus is, who the real Jesus is, okay? So we have to teach people all that he has taught us. Now, think about that for just a moment. Ryan, how long is this mission trip? Seven days, okay? How long was Jesus' mission trip? Three, three and a half years, right? Okay. He taught a long time. And even actually before that, if, if uh, let me ask you a question. Let's see how well we know these, these Bible stories. Who spoke to Moses from the burning bush? I heard several different, nobody wants to speak up real loud. Who was it? God, okay. If you look at your Bible, it'll say the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, which most theologians, that I, and I would agree with them, would tell you that this is a pre-incarnated Christ. The angel of the Lord. You, talk, uh, you go back to the story of the talking donkey that I was talking about. You'll see a, an instance where there's the angel of the Lord standing before this man that's beaten his donkey with a flaming sword. Who do you think that is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So, does all that Jesus taught us, does it only happen in the four Gospels? No. It's from, from Genesis 1 to the book of Maps, right? And I say the book of Maps because even though it's not the revealed Word of God, He created the things that the maps are based off of, right? Okay? He created it all. We have to know and understand who Jesus is. So how do we do that? I want us to look at another passage here really quick. Um, look at Luke 24. Luke 24. Has Jesus ever surprised you? If I can get here to it. Luke 24, and, and I will give you a picture here. You'll remember the story. There's a couple of his disciples. We're not given their names. They're walking down the road, and, and all of a sudden they come across this man. And this man, they're talking about the crucifixion, about Jesus dying and, and everything. And he says, what is this that you guys are talking about? And they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem that hasn't heard about these things? He goes, what things? And they said, yeah, and said, he, we, we thought this guy was the guy that was going to redeem us, that he was going to save us from the Romans and everything else. And, and even beyond that, there's some of the women amongst us. They went to, to his, his uh, tomb this morning, and they claimed that he's not there, and some others went and found it just as they described. We have no idea what's going on. And the guy says, hey, isn't it that the Christ has to suffer in the way that you're describing based off of Scripture? And they're like, What? So here, if we look at Luke 24, verses 26 and 27, we will see, was it not necessary, this is Jesus speaking, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They don't know yet this is Jesus, but in a little bit, he reveals himself to them and just poof, disappears. How do we teach Jesus? How do we teach people what he's taught us? We tell the stories of the Bible. In, in these great church um, um, movements, planning movements, we call them CPMs, church planning movements, and the great church planning movements, something that I have been amazed that always occur is that the people that are starting these churches, they do one thing in common. They tell the same Bible stories over and over and over again. They tell people about creation. They tell them about the fall of man in the garden. They tell people about the flood, 
about the Tower of Babel. They tell them about Abraham and the, and, and the other patriarchs. They tell them about the miracles of God and, and uh, uh, of Moses talking to the angel of the Lord on the mountain and, and then Moses leading the people out of, of Egypt. They go through in, in the major stories of the Bible. I'm not saying the rest of them aren't important. My point is, there's a consistency here of telling people about what God has done and let people know that this is Jesus that's done this. And then when it comes time to do that baptism, let me ask you a question. What would you do for somebody? I don't want to bring this up, but I'm going to because somebody else already brought it up to me. My wife posted this on Facebook. You know, I'm, I'm with the fire department and Fruta, and, and I was involved in saving a guy's life last year, and I got recognized for it, okay? Only thing I did was jump up and down on the guy's chest. I didn't do anything else, Okay. But let's just imagine for a moment that you're getting ready to get hit by a bus and somebody comes by and pushes you out of the way. You're, you got your, your foot caught in the, in the train tracks, right? And somebody comes over and rescues you just in the nick of time before the train runs over you. What are you going to do for that person? What would you want to do for that person? Anything and everything that they would want you to do, right? Right? Kelly will tell you, I love to set up women, okay? We have people come to us counseling, and, and uh, like we have this one young lady right now, she just so desperately wants to meet the man of her dreams and get married. And I said, you know what you need, Carrie? She said, what? I said, you just need to meet a man that's willing to die for you. <laughs> man, if there was any of those left, I said, I know one that already has, right? When we tell the stories of Jesus From beginning to end, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, you don't have to invite people to surrender their life to Christ. They just will. They just will. So this whole aspect of making disciples, we go because he saved our life, right? He has saved our life, and what would we do for a person that saved our life? We'll do anything they ask. He is my Lord. He is my Master. He is much more than my Savior. I do not preach salvation. I preach surrendership. I preach surrendership because if He truly has died for me and I believe that, what in my life will I not surrender to Him? If you have yet to surrender your life to Him, Have you read these stories? Do you know them? If you do, then you know that he has done all these great things for you. And what would you not do for somebody that has died for you? Why would you not surrender to somebody that has better things in store for your life than you could ever imagine that you could come up with on your own? So when we tell folks these stories, they naturally will surrender their lives. They will be like the folks at the day of Pentecost that they'll cry out to Peter, What must I do to be saved? You don't have to give an invitation. It just happens. It just happens. And when it happens, we baptize them into the family. You know what? My family is messed up, and I bet you yours is too. Right? Some of you is looking at your spouses. That's kind of scary to think about. Okay? (laughs) But all of our families are messed up. But you know what? I love my messed up family. I love this messed up family because you guys call us family. In fact, that's the thing Kelly and I cherish about this church. See, there was a a coup of people that came into our home church and destroyed the church and they chased out all of our family. We are no longer welcome there because we don't have family there anymore. I'm not talking about our immediate family, even though they were part of them that that were... uh, run out. But I'm talking about our blood relatives, those that were blood related to through Christ, right? We were baptized into the church. And some of it, you evidently don't know about this. This has happened some time ago, but our home church back in Ohio, uh, it, it's, it's more like a cult now. It really is. But they ran all of the people out that we used to be part of the family of there. And that church, there's only a handful of people that we would even know their names if we showed up there today. Okay? It's not our family but I'm still related to those family members through Christ. And when we go back to Ohio, other than our immediate family, you know who we go see? 
we go see those family members. When we come here, even though I pastor a small church in Fruta, this is my family. When my mom and dad passed away a few years ago, this is the family that picked us up and loved on us and took care of us. This is the family that I get to go out and beat up on golf, right? Okay? We go play golf together. We support each other in missions. We support each other in the Word when it hurts and when it's encouraging. We're honest with each other. When we tell people about Jesus and they realize and understand who He really is, we don't have to invite them into the family. They want to be adopted into the family. So we baptize them into the family and then we continue to teach. And we continue to learn because a good disciple is not only a teacher, they're a learner. Somebody's always following you, but you got to remember we're always following somebody. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul's saying, I still am learning, okay? We need to be a little pulse. We need to continue to learn and yet disciple as we go. Then the last part of this is, is the greatest. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When's the end of the age? There is no end of the age. There might be the end of this age, but the age, he's promised us eternity. Why would we fear going when he says he's always going to be there with us and even before us, before we get there, right? Again, I ask you a couple questions. One is, if you don't know these stories, find somebody here that does and just ask them. I've had three people in the last two weeks that didn't know about Abraham. I told you already about the gentleman who didn't know about the Ten Commandments. The interesting thing is, even the stories they do know, they got a very messed up understanding of what actually happened. The problem in the mission area that we live in is that people know the name of Jesus, but they don't know the real Jesus. Mormon missionaries came to my house a few years ago, and we were talking about uh, polygamy. And he says, they said, well, even God told Abraham to have more than one wife. I said, oh, I think you misread that story. And I took him to the Bible and showed him in, that, in the Bible what it actually had to say. God didn't tell him anything. They took matters into their own hands, didn't they? Okay. If we just educate people on who the real Jesus is, the disciple making is a piece of cake. We don't need to invent, invent, invent events or to have special programs. Only thing we got to do is be a family that studies the Word of God, shares the Word of God, and the rest of it is Him. He takes care of it. I have never led anybody to Christ. I've introduced a lot of people to Christ. Right? Second thing is, are you going? Are you going? You might not be going on this mission trip. I don't know of a sane person that would go on this mission trip. Sorry, right? Bunch of teenagers, right? But are you on mission? Are you on mission at work? Are you on mission on your street? Are you on mission at Walmart? Are you willing to go to see the Navajos? to go to Haiti, to go to Nepal, or any place else for that matter. If you surrendered your life, here's the bigger question, is it your decision to make it all in the first place? He's asking us to be obedient. And delayed obedience is still disobedient. If you don't think so, think about what you would do to your kids if you told them to take out the trash and they waited a couple days to do it. Right? Right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I do so thank you for this church. I thank you for Ryan and the group that's going to, to share the love of Christ with the Navajos. Lord, we do pray for our missionaries globally, for all that they are willing to sacrifice for the name. Lord, I pray for all of us here that as we have been baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that you would empower us and help us to remember the power that we have to do the will of God. Lord, call us all 
to be missionaries on a daily basis. Overseas and right here at home. And Lord, if there's one here that has yet to understand who Jesus really is, I I pray, Lord, that you would open up their eyes and their ears today. Be with Ray, bring him home to us safely. And Lord, I don't have to ask you for blessings, but I will thank you for them in advance. For it's in Christ's powerful name we pray, amen. Thank you.